So a couple of days ago, I was looking at my uh, channel analytics, like the attention-obsessed egomaniac that I am, and I noticed something. All of a sudden, I was getting all this traffic. Many more views than I had been getting on average for the rest of my videos. So of course, I'm thinking, all right, this is, this is pretty cool. But then I was like, hang on a second here. Why, why is this? It's not like there was anything different about the quality of video that I was doing. I hadn't really been promoting it in any new places that I hadn't already been. But all of a sudden, all these new viewers were showing up to the channel. So then I dug into it. I looked at the, uh, the, the sources for, this, uh, for these views and which videos they were viewing. It was my QAnon content. Specifically, the QAnon content. And it was all search results that were being guided to my channel. I'd gotten a couple of search result uh, hits before, but this particular video was through the roof in terms of its engagement as well as its uh, popularity. So then when I made another QAnon video a couple of days later, I was partially doing that as an experiment. Turns out, yeah, it was QAnon as a topic. There's something about that specific topic that just draws attention. Hmm. We're now well into the second decade of the social media era. And a lot of our attention is being guided by algorithms at this point. All of the stuff that you see on Facebook, all of the images that you see on Instagram, uh, all, the, all the items on Reddit, all the items on, well, YouTube, are being picked for you by an algorithm. It's not a human being sitting there and selecting which video shows up in your search results or what shows up on the next recommended list. It's a computer, a program that is devised to give you a recommendation, the, the next item on your list. But what's guiding this? What, why, why is this video being picked rather than that video? Why are these Facebook posts being promoted rather than that? Why do some people show up more often on your list than others? Well, the answer to this has to do with the tension. Let's back up for a second here. It's been said that if you can't figure out why you're getting something for free, it's because you're the product. And I think that's very much the case in terms of social media. You're basically the product that's being sold rather than the user of any given platform. For Facebook, for example, it's the advertisers. It's the people that pay for the advertising, people who promote their sponsored posts that are the actual revenue income for Facebook. The users are basically just a raw resource. Your eyeballs are being sold to the advertisers using Facebook as the platform to do so. So as such, these algorithms are meant to engage you, meant to draw your attention and hold it on the screen so that your eyeballs can be sold to advertisers. On the surface, there's nothing nefarious about this. Obviously, the algorithm is going to want to promote to you stuff that you're going to want to look at, stuff that's going to be enticing to you, stuff that might be interesting. But there's other ways of drawing attention than just interesting things. The ability to evoke emotional affect is oftentimes more powerful at drawing attention than any sort of rational information. Whereas you, whereas you might find an interesting article about some topic that doesn't really make you feel anything, if you're shown something that really evokes a, a visceral sense of, like, outrage or joy or some other very powerful emotion, you're certainly going to be more drawn to it than you would be if it was just some interesting fact. There's probably a evolutionary reason for this. As someone who lives on the plains of Africa in a hunter-gatherer society, one is going to be much more interested in the things that cause one an emotional reaction. If one is being stalked by a lion, for example, well, that's kind of scary. We're bound to be paying attention to that sensation of fear, or that sensation of anger towards someone that is putting your tribe at jeopardy. These sorts of powerful emotions are a survival reflex. They're, they're able to, by definition, override your reasoning. Because really, our, our minds aren't very good at thinking quickly in a reasonable way. If we stopped and paused to ponder the motivations and the, the nature of what it is to be a lion before taking action about that lion, well, we're lion food. But if, however, we take a snap decision, just instantly leap into action, then, well, we're more likely to be able to survive the lion attack. So similarly, 
any other stimuli that provokes a strong emotion or a, a guttural response or some sort of adrenaline rush is going to be much more enticing, much more attention drawing to the, the, to the mind than any other sort of stimuli might be. We might find the temptation of food to be interesting, we might find a, an interesting rock formation interesting, but it's the lion that really takes the lion's share of our attention. In terms of social media, we can definitely detect what sorts of stimuli are most enticing to the emotion. QAnon, as I have now discovered, is one of these things. And it's easy to see why. It's a very polarizing topic. It's something where either you're part of the QAnon thing and you're like super duper into it, you're, you're very passionately defending the movement and pushing out anybody who has any, any criticism of it, or you're probably someone who thinks that the QAnon people are idiots, or you just, you, you are angry about the QAnon folks for the things that they've done, the things that they believe, and the things that they want to do. There's very little middle ground here. Now, I was trying to provide a, a nuanced and subtle explanation of the QAnon phenomenon. I was providing a, a, an analysis from a psychoanalytic model from, like, uh, why it is that someone would want to join a cult, what sort of narrative vacuum might produce the kind of cult behavior that QAnon exhibits. But the, the very fact that I mention this topic uh, shows up on the algorithm as being something that's a contentious topic. And as such, when people were searching for QAnon or QAnon collapse or QAnon cult, they ended up at my, my page. Which, like, cool. And if you're one of those folks, well, welcome to my channel. I, I hope you're enjoying the content. Uh, but it's probably not the most interesting thing that I talk about. In fact, it was just one little thing that, that I found interesting at that moment. There's lots more to be explored. Problem is, most of our media diets come from these algorithms now. <laughs> and so it gives us a skewed perception of what the world is like. If these algorithms are looking to capture our attention and hold on to it, and they're doing so by feeding us this outrageous, emotionally voluble content, we're going to have a vision of the world that's a lot more turbulent than it actually is. And for that matter, it's going to inflame any of those conflicts that already do exist. I've noticed on Facebook, I think the algorithm changed about a month ago or so, where rather than being, and it already wasn't very much like this before, but rather than being an up-to-date uh, index of what's been posted most recently, it's things that are getting the most conversation, the most engagement. A post that's like two, three days old that has a new post, a new reply on it, will suddenly show up on my feed as if it was brand new. And I've noticed that it's doubly the case if the nature of that reply is contentious in some way. If it uses emotionally charged language, or if it's a, a call-out of some sort, or if it's, you know, just volatile in some other way. So by rewarding posts and any other content that has this emotionally volatile characteristic to it, it's actually incentivizing us to be more emotionally volatile, to be more incendiary in our comments and in our posts in general. Like, if, if I wanted to be super powerful and famous on YouTube, I could make all sorts of volatile content. I could talk about QAnon ad nauseum, and I could also dive into some of the other contentious topics. I'm not going to do that because that's not really my style, man. I'm certainly no stranger to controversy. I hold a very extreme view as compared to the standard narrative, but... That also is a matter that um, this algorithm controls. Things that are supportive of the status quo are certainly going to be more valuable to the algorithm and its presentation, but also a certain amount of dissent to the status quo is obviously allowed. For the folks that are part of the QAnon thing or the MAGA thing, they're certainly not in congruence with the status quo, the liberal majority, the liberal establishment, but it's close enough that it polarizes the liberal establishment against those folks. And so paradoxically, by showing this controversial anti-establishment narrative, it actually reinforces the establishment narrative by controversy. I'm not so sure about that same thing being the case for what I'm talking about because oftentimes I'm talking about 
total economic change, and it's a fully-fledged transformational approach to economics and politics and society that would basically end the attention economy. I would like to see a day where advertising is no longer even a thing, and especially not the public sphere, like the, the de facto public square where we do all of our communications. That ought not to be full of advertising. Sure, there is a, a place for, for doing advertising, and certainly in the public sphere is there a place for doing advertising, but it's invasive. It's manipulating us in order to capture our eyeballs. It's manipulating our discourse simply to sell products. This, to my mind, is unethical and anti-democratic. It needs not to be the case. Words cannot adequately describe just how much I despise advertising. All of my web browsers have incredibly strong double-layered ad blockers. I, you know, I pay for YouTube Premium because I just, I hate those advertisings. Uh, I, I go out of my way to avoid advertising in everything that I do. And when I see an advertisement in public, I pay attention to it. It's easy to say, oh, well, you know, advertising doesn't affect me because I just ignore it. But when you ignore it, that advertising is actually working on you even more so, because it's getting to you subliminally. You're taking this in, and sometimes you might laugh at a clever commercial or something like that. And yeah, the Super Bowl's coming up, you'll see lots of clever commercials that'll turn into memes in the next week or so. What's up? But by paying attention to the commercial, by analyzing it, by seeing how it's affecting your affect, your emotional affect, then you can start to resist it effectively. The key thing to remember here is that it's not operating on you rationally. Most of these advertisements are not operating in terms of like, hey, this is our product, this is why our product is good, this is why you should buy our product. It's like, here is a lifestyle, here is the idea of happiness, here is the idea of satisfaction, and if you buy our product, well, you can have that sensation of satisfaction too. All of your worries will go away. Don't you want to be cool like us who buy this product? Consequently, I am no hypocrite. If this channel ever gets big enough that it qualifies for monetization on YouTube, I ain't doing it. I'm not going to put advertisements on this channel, because I know how much I would hate it, and I don't want to subject you, the viewer, to that. So I guess I'll need some sort of other financial model. Anyway, speaking of which, I'm trying to build an audience here, so if you do like my content, uh, I would really appreciate it if you tried helping to build the audience, share it with your friends, and like the channel, because it'll help with that algorithmic popularity. And um, yeah, thanks for watching. Uh, this one's a little disjointed, so see you tomorrow.